So this past week, um, we went to CIY Believe, and that is a junior high conference. Um, it, is, it was absolutely spectacular. Here is the group of kids that uh, came down. We had, uh, we had 10, or we had 11 kids, uh, plus two sponsors, me and Courtney. And uh, let's just say it was awesome. It was, uh, my brain's a little still fried from the experience, <laughs> sharing a van with all of them. And for some reason, they like to do pterodactyl screams. And I don't know if that was a thing when you guys were raising kids. Maybe they just screamed high-pitched noises, but they took turns being pterodactyls pretty much the whole weekend. And so, <laughs> yeah, my brain is fried. They also learned some valuable wisdom from me, uh, although they didn't take it. Uh, but at Buffalo Wild Wings, I told them not to try the atomic sauce. But, you know, they're like, hey, we're parents aren't here. Like, he's just the youth minister. What does he know, right? So a few of them had the hot sauce, and they were absolutely miserable. I mean, I'm not going to name this one kid in particular, but the guy, the waiter, felt so bad that he went and got him free milk, two of them, because he was literally dying. And so, yeah, that was that Bible verse, you know, respect your elders, but, you know, <laughs> maybe they'll learn from next time. They learned a valuable lesson. But anyway, so here's some pictures of the, the gathering that was there. They had about two to 3,000 junior hires in Springfield that came, and it was just, it was just a phenomenal experience. Um, and so what they learned about this week, the theme uh, was about their identity, and that their worth is not determined uh, by the world, but by the one who created them. The theme was, I am, and here are some bold truths about their identity that they learned this weekend as revealed by God's word. They learned that I am loved, I am forgiven, I am known, I am a child of God, I am a masterpiece, I am cared for, and I am a light to others. I can truly say it's amazing to see the Spirit move amongst two to 3,000 teens as they worship, as they, as they learned, and as they were challenged this weekend. And it's great to be reminded about not just who we are, but whose we are. But one of the things that they also stressed about this event, even though the theme was I am, is that it's not about me. It's about he. And in scripture, Jesus makes some I am statements about himself, about who he is. In fact, Jesus makes seven specific I am statements to help us clearly understand who he is. Like, and here's a few of them. I am the bread of life. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. And one of the things I love about Jesus is despite his vast intelligence, he made really hard things to understand uh, very clear through parables and also through using everyday familiar imagery that we see all around us. So it's interesting because his humility is revealed once again just by the way he chooses to communicate. You know, he could have he wrote down this super complex thing that took us centuries to extract you know, and for some other truths it did, but he could have made it so exhaustive that it, it, we could never, it took us too long to crack it, but that was not his intention in coming here. It was to be clearly understood. And so Jesus used symbols that his audience would have been familiar with. He used symbols like shepherding and sheep. He used the, I am the gate. He used the gate. They see gates all the time, you know, vines, uh, bread. These are things that they dealt with every day. He used these to convey important truths about who he was. And this is also something the Jewish people did all the time. Um, during their festivals, the Jews tied meaning to pretty much everything. Uh, every event, every little ritual within their holiday meant something. It tied back to something in their faith. And growing up, I loved learning about the Jewish festivals. I remember I was so passionate about them. I went to my pastor. was like, we need to scrap Christmas. We need to scrap Easter. We need to celebrate the festivals because they, they have all the themes that we're missing. They, they really, everything they do is about, is about this, you know, and I was like, we need to do that with our, with our Easter and our Christmas, we need to go and like, we need to tie a bunch of symbols to everything, and like, like everything we do, make it connect to, to God instead of Santa and presents and all of this stuff, and I was so passionate, because I just loved the passion that the Jews had for celebrating in their festivals, they really knew how to throw a party, and so, uh, it's, but it's, uh, not only did these people know how to throw a really big party, but they also made it special by tying important events and symbols from their faith into the festivals, they use symbols, things that they uh, had all around them all the time to make bold statements about their faith, just like Jesus. And as Christians, we're familiar with some of these I am statements that Jesus makes in Scripture, but we usually miss out on the depth of what Jesus is saying when he makes these I am statements because we don't understand the historical backdrop, the, the background in which he's making them. And so that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at one festival in particular where Jesus makes two claims. And I believe that by giving you this historical backdrop that's in the text, 
it really comes to life. It really, it really brings out what Jesus is saying. And so today we're going to look at a week-long festival called the Feast of Tabernacles. And it truly was a time to celebrate. Okay, so this was a week-long celeb- uh, celebration. It began at the fall harvest. So figs, pomegranates, dates, and grapes have all been gathered. So there's a ton of food. Perfect recipe for a party so far, right? The olives hung heavy on the trees. Now was a time to be glad. And following God's command, the people, they built booths of olive, palm, and myrtle branches. And they provided shade, but they also made sure that the branches had just enough space in them so that whenever they camped out, they could see the stars and see the sky. And this was to remind them of the years that they spent in the wilderness, that God still provided for them. And so for seven days, the people ate, lived, and slept in these booths. And since this was one of the three feasts uh, that they were commanded to come to, the other ones are Passover and Shabbat, but since these this was one of the big three that they're commanded to come to. We're talking about thousands upon thousands of people crowded the city. Uh, there were booths literally everywhere. So just kind of picture that. I mean, the children loved it, and so did the adults. It was a time to praise God for the past gifts of freedom, land, and a bountiful harvest. But during the seven-day festival, there were these two rituals that happened every day, one at night and one in the morning. The one at night was called the torchlight ceremony or the festival of lights. And let's just say from a rehabilitated pyromaniac. It sounds really awesome. Okay, so let's get into this torchlight ceremony. So if you don't know this, light had a really, really big symbolic uh, meaning throughout Jewish culture and tradition and in the scriptures. They used this, they symbolized light to mean, to reference God's presence, salvation, and his revelation. So there's some big things tied into light in scripture. But the focus of the Feast of Tabernacles was to remind the Israelites of the time that they lived in the wilderness. And so during this festival, there's a lot of things they're doing to remind themselves of when they were in that period in the wilderness. And so the torchlight ceremony was specifically to remind them to celebrate the pillar of fire that delivered them from the Israelites, uh, that, or delivered the Israelites through the wilderness uh, out of bondage from their captives, the Egyptians. So at the end of the day, during the feast, uh, the temple was gloriously illuminated by four gigantic candelabras that stood in the court of women. Each one of the four golden candelabras was over 75 feet tall. So that's, uh, that's maybe hard for you to visualize, but imagine two telephone poles stacked on top of each other. That's how tall these giant candelabras were, okay? And there's four of them. So imagine how, I can't even imagine like that. And so each candelabra, I might only have two arms, but they had four branches. So one, and then imagine another one, and then two, or three and four. And so these huge, like, Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast candle things, right, are there. And on each branch, on each one, is a bowl that is capable of holding, like, a ton of oil. And what they would do is some uh, four young men of Levitical priestly descent, so these guys are going to be the upcoming priests. Keep in mind, these are like the bachelors of Israel, right? <laughs> like, all the girls are probably swooning over these four guys, you know? And so uh, they would carry 10 gallons, uh, 10 gallon pitchers of oil. Now, uh, you've probably seen the five-gallon water thingy jugs. Imagine double that. That's pretty heavy. They would carry these things up these giant ladders, 75 feet in the air, and fill these bowls with oil and then light them on fire. Like, I missed my calling, Dave. That's what I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be this guy that just climbs up and lights things on fire. Like, what an awesome... <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm going to wind down a little bit. Okay, so picture these 16 in total, because there's four of these, each four bowls, so 16 beautiful blazing bowls leaping up towards the sky from these golden lamps. Now remember the temple, it was on a hill above the rest of the city. So the glorious glow was a sight for the entire city to see, and they did this every night. And it is said that not a single courtyard in all the town was said to be in darkness. So while this was going on, as if that wasn't enough, these, there were these rabbis there. And we think of rabbis as like these old Jewish people, right? Like they don't do anything fun. You guys are so wrong on that. Listen to some of these things that these rabbis would do. So uh, they would do acrobatics and juggle uh, as part of the festival. And although we don't typically think of these well-respected rabbis as doing gymnastics, they were actually quite nimble and very well-rounded gymnasts. One renowned rabbi in particular was recorded as being able to do a handstand on two fingers. And uh, it's pretty impressive. And many of them would juggle various objects, eight to ten lit torches, glasses of wine, or knives and swords. So this isn't just like, hey, look, I got three balls and I'm juggling. They they are juggling, you know, eight to ten flaming torches and glass of wine. I don't know how you do that, but uh, 
it kind of blows my mind. But anyway, it was a joyous celebration. So I'm kind of painting the scene for you guys. This is a time to celebrate. These guys know how to party, but they're also tying it all back to the time when they were in the wilderness. And so it was during one of these nights, during the festival, that most likely in the midst of this torchlight ceremony that Jesus spoke up in front of these 75-foot-tall candelabras and makes this bold claim. I can ima- it's hard to imagine how Jesus was feeling as he's kind of— imagine him in the crowd kind of undetected. He's watching these people celebrate, and I imagine his heart's breaking a little bit. And I imagine he's got a lot of eagerness because they're celebrating a pillar of fire that led them out of bondage through the world uh, and into the wilderness— away from their captives, and Jesus is about to stand up and shine true meaning. He's about to reveal and redefine everything they thought they knew about God's symbolic purpose for the pillar of fire. He's about to shed some light on what actually the pillar of fire was representing. And it's with full of compassion in this moment, he declares this bold statement. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So wow, Jesus is declaring that he is the divine presence that leads people out of their bondage. The pillar of fire was pointing to Jesus. Jesus is the pillar of fire that leads people to their salvation. So imagine hearing this as a Jewish person uh, person during the festival, the implications of what this would mean to them. They had already heard stories most likely of this man, uh, and it was in this period of time when people were desperately seeking the Messiah. They knew he was, the time was right for the Messiah, and so they were expecting him to come. And they've heard these stories probably circulating about this man named Jesus. And so imagine hearing and seeing right before you a man testifying to be the very thing you hoped for the most. Can you imagine the whispering and the gasp of surprise as he stood up and made this blasphemous, really, uh, statement, which wouldn't be blasphemy because he is the Son of God, but could you imagine how that would fill the courtyard? So it's no wonder why then the Pharisees immediately want to contain this man and arrest him because they feared a riot was going to break out. And these riots, if they break out, the Jews, the Jewish leaders were held responsible by the Romans, and that was that was not good. And so, also, they just hated the guy. So, of course, they wanted him arrested. And so, Jesus is essentially saying in all of this, he's saying, hey, forget about these giant candles back here. Forget about the pillar of fire that you're celebrating. I'm the true pillar of fire in your midst. God was using the pillar of fire as a symbol of me. So, what amazing revelation that Jesus makes during the festival. But it's not his only claim during the festival. Uh, the festival of light happened at night, the torchlight ceremony. But Jesus makes another claim. And although it's not one of the seven classic I am statements, It's sometimes referred as the eighth I am statement. But before we get to that, I want you to try to think of a time when you were in need of water. So that you were so thirsty, you felt like you were like going to die. I kind of like how I feel right now because I'm talking so much. All right. But uh, watch this video really quick. The water. I shot that Gambardia. Think about drinking after that, whatever that creature thing is. So if you didn't know, that was Star Wars. So, you know, I'm just letting you guys know. Uh, but, uh, but I remember times during mission trips or decently long car rides that I do this thing where I intentionally I don't drink a lot of coffee or water. And I also try not to eat spicy foods or things that I know are going to mess me up because I don't want to be in this situation where I have to use the restroom and we're still a few hours away because that is literally like, I can't think of anything worse. Like I refuse to, I will suffer, I will dehydrate, sorry kidneys, so that I do not have to go through that. And so I can remember times that I would classify as being, you know, I would personally classify as being really, really thirsty. And I'm going to let you guys know a little secret about myself. When I'm thirsty, I'm really grouchy as most of us probably are. And so I also remember times during soccer practices during, you know, mi- mid-August when I, when I would first start, you know, really getting into to getting in conditioning and stuff, that I'd be running sprints. And you know, us lambs, we're not sprinters. You know, we may frolic to a green pasture. But we, don't, we don't sprint, okay? And, uh, but I remember during these sprints that I felt like my throat was caving in. I mean, literally when the coach would call a water break, I would bulldoze, or in this case, lambdoze, someone to get to the water. And the sad part is, though, in reality, many of us, we know very, 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 very little about thirst compared to those who live in third world countries or people in the past when water really wasn't as accessible as it is today. And so this other ceremony has to do with water. I'm trying to build that case towards it. Uh, 
The other ceremony during the festival, it took place during the morning, and it was called the water drawing ceremony. And so there was this man-made uh, reservoir in Jerusalem called the Pool of Siloam. I think I have a picture yet there. So that's the Pool of Siloam, yeah, the little arrow is pointing to, and that's the temple up there. And so um, this was the only permanent water source for the city of Jerusalem uh, during this period. It was fed by the waters of the Gihon Spring. And each morning during the festival, what would happen is the priest would carry, would carry this golden pitcher to be filled in the Pool of Siloam. And it would be brought back to the altar in the courtyard in the temple to be poured out. And so the pouring of the water on the altar, it had historic and, and prophetic meaning. Because the waters of Siloam, that pool, were used, those waters were used to anoint the king, uh, the house of David, the kings in the house of David. And so that anointing was symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming on an individual. And so they did this in remembrance of Isaiah 44.3, which reads, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land, and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring, and my blessing on your descendants. And then also, they did this in, I, for, uh, in Isaiah 12.3, which reads, Therefore you will draw waters from the wells of salvation. So the Pool of Siloam became known as the Well of Salvation, and it was associated with the mes Messianic Age. The Jewish people of the Second Temple days, they attributed the pouring of the water out on the altar uh, to the Holy Spirit being poured out during the time of the Messiah. So this was something they were really, really looking forward to. Like many of us, you know, like, we also look forward to Jesus returning. So this was equivalent to us, you know, thinking of Jesus returning was them waiting for the Messiah to arrive. You know, like, they, this is something they celebrate, they really want. And so um, visualize this for a moment. The priest is coming back from the Pool of Siloam with this golden pitcher. I love all things gold, by the way. Anyway, all the people were waiting for him to draw the water, and once he did, once he got that water from the Pool of Siloam, thousands of people would follow in behind him with lyres, cymbals, uh, harps, uh, and they would be singing praises. The rabbis with their torch juggling and all that stuff would be along them. As the, and it was this huge parade. As he would make his way back to the altar, there was this huge celebration. It was, it was tons of noise and, and tons of children clapping and cheering. And the ancient rabbis are quoted for of saying that he who has never witnessed this water-drawing ceremony, they didn't really know what rejoicing was. was. That, this was that this was something I think I can't even picture. We think we know what celebration is, but this was literally pure joy, this festival. And so, but before it was poured out, the Levites would chant, and the people would chant the uh, Psalms 113 through 118. And just before the, it was poured, there was this moment of absolute silence. And it's probably the first time during this water drawing ceremony that there was any, you know, lack of noise. But, uh, from the instruments and people cheering, but the silence was anticipation of the water to be poured out on the altar. I imagine all the people kind of waiting on pins and needles, you know, they're all like leaning in, waiting for that pitcher to be poured and the water to fall on the altar. And Jesus, right now, he's, he's in the crowd. He's largely unnoticed. And I'm sure that, again, his heart is breaking with the deepest form of compassion and eagerness because these people are celebrating, you know, looking forward to the Messiah coming and, and when the promised outpouring of the Holy Spirit would happen. But at this moment, in the silence, he cries out. And the Greek word is krazo, and it means to yell so loud that everyone can hear. So he belts this saying in John 7, 37 through 38, which reads... If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. You see, once again, they did not understand the symbolism that they were celebrating. That it was in their midst. Jesus the Messiah was among them. The water that they were celebrating that was drawn in the future prospect of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would come through and from Jesus. And they're drawing water from the Pool of Siloam when the well of salvation is in their midst. So many times I forget during our holidays, during times of remembering uh, Jesus, or even talking about Jesus, that he is at those moments and right now among us. And I wonder how many people pass us by not knowing that Jesus is amongst them, just like the people at the festival, because we don't seize the moment and speak up and declare who Jesus is. However, this is not the only place that Jesus makes this bold statement. If you've been with us the past couple of weeks, you've heard Dave teach about the woman at the well. And this is, this is one of my favorite passages. And we're very, because we're very familiar with physical thirst, but, when it, but we're not really with spiritual thirst. And Jesus uses this concept of thirst, something that we all know and understand, to teach us about a, uh, a deeper, unknown thirst that we really need during this, and this is during this encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. I remember as a kid, what I loved the most about youth trips is one, my parents were not around. <laughs> <laughs> and all the soda and the junk food that they never let me have, believe it or not, my parents are actually strict, I know, right? But, uh, 
This is what happens when you're strict to your kids. They turn out like me. I'm just saying. But uh, all that stuff that they never let me have, it became free game. <laughs> it became free game. And so, but seriously, is there anything more glorious as a kid than those gas stations with like 20-something, you know, choices of soda? And a lot of my friends would do what's called a suicide. They'd mix all these drinks together. And the result was it was always absolutely disgusting. And I never understood why they kept doing it, which is why since I didn't get soda very often, I stuck to a few sodas I knew that would not disappoint. So when it comes to physical thirst, or when it comes not just to physical thirst, but spiritual thirst, the world, it offers us this endless soda fountain of choices. We learned over the couple past weeks that the, women at the, that the woman at the well was trying to quench her thirst through relationships. But the thing about spiritual thirst is you can sort of quench it as well, but like physical thirst, it always returns. And the woman at the well, she tried to find her fulfillment, her meaning, her identity in relationships. And uh, many of us, we do the same thing, whether it's romantic or it's, a fr- or it's a friendship. We expect that person to be our everything, which is really, it's so unfair. And it puts so much unrealistic pressure on one person because they can't be your everything. They're going to fail you from time to time. And they were never meant to be that replacement for Jesus. No one can cure that thirst, only Jesus. And for many of us, if it's not relationships, then it's something else. Every day we return to our worldly well, just like the Samaritan woman, and in search of our choice of drink uh, that distracts us from this spiritual thirst or quenches temporarily this, this longing to get more out of life. And so for maybe some of us, when we go to the worldly well, we draw out drugs or drunkenness. Maybe this is what temporarily distracts us uh, from this, this, this thirst that we have. Maybe when you feel defeated or you're looking for some deeper fulfillment in your life, you turn to drunkenness. For others, maybe it's sports or politics. Maybe this is what you draw from. You spend all of your time wrapped up in the sports of the political world, and that's what gets you through your day. And you think that, it, that, that this will solve all of your problems, that if just this bill was passed or these policies removed, then that thirst, that longing of something more out of life will finally be quenched. Or maybe it's money or materialism, the pursuit of, of stuff, the accumulation of wealth. Maybe that, that you feel you fall back on comfort in these times of when you're feeling this thirst. Maybe it's this security or the pursuit of it that you believe can cure this thirst. And I, um, or maybe it's endless hours of TV or entertainment or busyness. Maybe that's kind of like your go-to drink. And it's, it's something that, that keeps you from that deeper realization in the quiet times of your life that you are literally so lethally dehydrated spiritually. I could go on and on. We all have our own choice of drink that we draw from the worldly well, whether it's self-image, popularity, your career. This thirst, it cries out within us all. It pulsates within us. It demands drink, drink, drink. And although this option will temporarily quench it, it's not what we really need. You give soda to a dying man, or a, dying, a man dying of thirst, and he will actually, you will actually make his dehydration worse. Even though it may suit his, or soothe his throat temporarily, it's actually going to dehydrate him faster. The same is true with us. And so you see, the moment comes, whether it's a tragedy or it's a moment that we run for these drinks, uh, that, we r- that sometimes it's not there. The worldly well fails, fa- fails us. And you realize that you've been coping the wrong way. You've been distracting yourself from the thirst. You've been medicating the symptoms instead of the disease when the cure is in your midst. I call this cycle the curse of the thirst. And it's only something that the Holy Spirit, faith in Jesus, can, re- can reverse. Jesus mentions this at the festival and to the woman at the well when he says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become within them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He gives this analogy of the well being inside of us instead of on the outside, that those with the Spirit no longer need to draw from this worldly well to quench their thirst because they have a well within them, the Holy Spirit. The problem is we don't draw from it. And so many times us Christians, and like Dave says, and like I'll say, ten fingers pointed back at myself, instead of drinking deeply from this overflowing well of the Holy Spirit, through prayer and loving others, hearing and studying the Word, singing praises, we do the exact opposite. We go back to this worldly well. And what's worse for us as Christians is, in a lot of ways, we've just grown so entitled and accustomed to the hope that we have, that we have an eternity of paradise, new bodies, a new earth, uh, that's perfected, that, that we don't realize how severe the thirst is to those around us who don't have those guarantees or hope. And truthfully, the reason we have this longing, that we're meant for something more, 
is because we're created for something more. The promise that Jesus offers, eternal life, a world without pain, death, and suffering, and sickness, a new and perfected body, a timeless future of endless joy and discovery, these are the only things that will ever truly quench our thirst. And Jesus knows this. And if you're a Christian, I want you to ask yourself, are you hoarding this cure? Are you hoarding this, this cure to the curse of the thirst? Are you hoarding it for yourself? While thousands around us whose throats are dry and coarse and ragged are dying of thirst. The mom who works 60 hours a week, who doesn't have this hope, who's unappreciated and exhausted and wonders, is, there, is this all there is to life? Or the man who's lost it all, who's on the streets living in the cold, he's not sure if he's going to make it through the next winter, who looks up the sky and he wonders, is there hope? The prisoner who makes a mistake, they've lost their freedom, their one shot at life is crushed, and they wonder, is there forgiveness out there for them somewhere? Is this all there is to life? Or the youth around us who are bullied at school every day, who believe that they're worthless, that they have nothing going for them, and they think about ending it. Christians, we live in a broken world. Look into the eyes of the people around you, and they're dying inside. They're looking for anything and everything to distract them from this spiritual dehydration and from the pain that, of their never fully quenched thirst. This week, the youth of the church, they learned about this curse of the thirst, and that it's not something just adults suffer, but our youth as well. It just looks a little different in them. They seek to cure this thirst in three main areas, which many of us can relate to, whether it's performance, appearance, or relationship. So with performance, maybe it's if they just play harder, if they're just better at this sport, or if they study harder, if they get better grades, that they'll find this cure, so that this longing within them will finally be appeased. With appearance, maybe if they just look different, dress different, talk different, you know, it would finally be cured. Or relationships, or perhaps if they just had more friends, if they were more accepted, if they had a boyfriend or a girlfriend, it would finally, it would finally sedate this, this thirst within them. But, but the pursuit, it always ends in the same disappointment, just like it does for us adults. Because only Jesus can reverse this curse of the thirst. I want to encourage the adults in here today to begin to see our youth, to especially see our youth. We say that they're the future of the church, but they're not. They are the present of the church. And if we don't start treating them as the present of the church, they're never going to make it to the future. The last thing they need from us is seriously is a previous generation looking down on them as if they're hopeless generation and that their generation is doomed. Uh, I don't know one generation that's ever been impressed with another. I mean, Woodstock, come on guys. <laughs> we both have things that we can learn from each other. You know, age doesn't necessarily mean wisdom. And, and youth doesn't necessarily imply immaturity. We both have things that we can learn from each other, but one thing's for sure, the youth are struggling with the same things that we are. And I can tell you, they need the living water of the Holy Spirit to be poured out in their life today. You know, we're so appalled when we hear about how much the Jews hated the Samaritans, that it was so intense that they would go all the way around, adding days to their travel to go around Samaria. But do we do the same thing with our youth? I mean, ask yourself, is the youth room, is that your Samaria? Is that the last place you want to be? Uh, or when you're out in the world and you see a group of young people talking at the mall or at a store, do you take the longest trip around them or from them? Or are they even on our radar as people who need to be witnessed to, encouraged, and loved? As the worship team makes its way up, I want to challenge the adults here to interact and shepherd our youth more. It's so easy to make excuses uh, that it makes us uncomfortable or we're just, we're just too incompatible, but I want to note that love transcends all barriers. When Jesus so much as talks to the woman at the well, do you realize how many barriers he crosses? It's social, ethnic, racial, gender, cultural, and religious barriers to reach her. And you know why? Because there's no barrier that love will not trample over. All barriers and differences can be crossed because of the cross. Jesus is the pillar of fire that leads those in darkness to salvation, but is it shining through us for others to see? And Jesus reversed the curse of the thirst, but Christians, we hold the cups. Now is the time that we face another cup, a cup that holds the symbol of Jesus' sacrifice and deep love, that his blood is poured out for us and his body broken. It is a reminder that our salvation, although offered freely, it had a tremendous cost. When you go to these tables, I want you to look at all of those cups, not just the one you're taking. And I want you to think about all those empty hands out there who need this drink. They're dying of thirst. They need Jesus. If you cannot make it to the communion tables, please raise your hand and we'll make sure to bring them near to you. Let us pray. Lord, I pray that you send us out, Lord. That you send us out like the waves to crash over the thirsty. 
Lord, send this church out like a tsunami, like a tidal wave of living water to the dry and the calloused hearts of the hopeless. Lord, I pray that we become pillars of fire that reveal your truth to those who are wandering in the darkness. Help us step out of our comfort zones. Challenge us to see the youth through your eyes, to see them through the way that you see them, not through the mirrors, the man-made mirrors, or through the eyes of others, but through your eyes, Father. We are what you say we are, and nothing less. We are masterpieces. We are known. We are cared for. We are forgiven. We are loved. We are children of God. Amen.